Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event on For a People's Budget, No to Austerity 2.0, looking at how we respond to the Tories' offensive and the forthcoming budget on Wednesday, and more broadly, looking at how we respond to the deep economic crisis we are seeing unfold and both build resistance to the Tories and bit support for socialist solutions. I'm Apsana Begum, the MP for Poplar and Limehouse, and this event is hosted by Labour Assembly Against Austerity, along with Arise, a festival of Labour, Labour's left ideas, and our media partner, Labour Outlook. And all around the world, governments, as we know, including our own, are still failing to protect health and people in this pandemic. And our government is one of those that has most failed here and also most resorted to scapegoating to distract from the disastrous handling of the pandemic. They failed to stop the spread of the virus getting out of control yet again, and they have failed to give people the economic support that they so desperately need. How are people supposed to self-isolate when support is either low or non-existent? As we'll hear tonight, statutory sick pay remains at a disgraceful level. And yet the Tories remain obsessed with privatisation and outsourcing of our public services, despite the disaster of Circle with the test and track system. This discussion then is particularly important. And it's also important that we look to the future and the kind of economy and society that we need and the kind of society and econo economy that we want. Due to an amazing level of interest, as well as this Zoom webinar, we are streaming live directly from the Arise YouTube page and over a dozen Facebook pages. As the event goes on, please do post your questions in the comments below on the stream on there and in the Q&A section on Zoom, and we will put some to our panel. Please also donate at the link provided so we can continue to host these important events. And please sign and share the hashtag workers can wait. Workers Can't Wait petition to Rishi Sunak. Our speakers for this vital discussion on the budget and the crisis will each speak for up to six minutes. And it gives me great pleasure to invite to speak first, Sarah Woolley of the Bakers and Fast Food Workers Union. She's the General Secretary. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Hapsana, and thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. And apologies, I have to leave the event early to jump on another equally important meeting around COVID. I've had a look at what's expected to be announced on Wednesday. And, and as usual, the Tory approach is, is not to help and support those people that have struggled to survive this pandemic. It is purely focused on rebooting the economy. But how can the economy be rebooted without people having money to spend within it? And I'm sick of hearing about how people will have saved loads over the last 12 months, not being able to go out for most of it, not being able to go on holiday. It's insulting. It's insulting to the millions of people who are in rent arrears, those facing eviction, those that have fallen through the cracks of the support schemes that have been put in place, those that have had to dig into what savings they might have had that have long since gone, the millions more who are relying on food banks on a, on a weekly basis, and those that are unemployed, the highest number since records began. There are still millions on furlough trying to survive on 80% of their wages. Now, I don't know many people on minimum wage that have savings normally, never mind if they've been furloughed and have had to try and survive on 80% of minimum wage. And there are still millions who don't know if they have a job to go back to. And if they do, for how long they will have it. So for those talking about all these savings people are making, please stop. Because from what I can see, the only savings people are making is skipping meals so there's enough for their kids to have another one and turning off the heating so there's enough for another day. The budget isn't looking at the things that matter to people. 95% help to buy mortgages are no good if you haven't got, the, if you haven't got a chance of saving a 5% deposit. There's nothing in there around statutory sick pay, an increase in which would support people when they need it the most especially when their employer won't do the right thing and pay company sick pay. We've seen the disappointing announcement around the rise to the national minimum wage in April, just before Christmas, which they are now trying to sell as a positive. It's clearly not a living wage. It's nowhere near. And it gives little comfort to those that are reliant on it that things will get better and easier for them anytime soon. 
there's nothing in there about making access to decent nutritious food are right for everyone so children aren't going hungry and parents having to miss meals and there's nothing in there that i can see that offers any kind of safety net to people out of work there is the universal credit uplift extension but let's be honest it's not good enough and there are no guarantees that there will be access to decent quality well-paid jobs there's nothing to stop employers setting people on on a zero hours contract, for example, using the pandemic as an excuse for the need of flexibility, because we know that will happen. The Tories have removed funding from Union Learn because it doesn't fit in their agenda going forward, a, a fund that has allowed hundreds of thousands of people access to education that aren't reached by any other method at a, at a time when unemployment is at an all time high because their schemes are apparently not niche. However, the Kickstart scheme that was launched has taken on a little over 2,000 young people out of over a million who are out of work. It's not working. As usual, the Tories and this budget will be out of touch. They have no idea what normal working people have had to go through this last 12 months. They don't care. And what's disappointing is the leadership of the Labour Party don't seem to either. And I say leadership as there is some brilliant work going on by Labour MPs that will be on the call tonight and the likes of Ian Byrne. Because focus groups won't put food on a working family's table, won't reduce the need for food banks and won't pay people's rent. This budget should be about transforming the lives of working people out of what has been the most horrendous 12 months that any of us have ever seen. Austerity 2.0 is not going to reboot the economy. It's just going to create more poverty and more suffering in our communities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I really think that was really important what you said about precarious workers and, and what we're seeing throughout the pandemic on fiery hire, but also, you know, how uh, the the Supreme Court ruling on, on Uber workers, for example, as, as you know, uh, leading the fight back in a lot of ways as well. And, and hopefully we, we see companies like Uber abide by the ruling and, and make sure that they give workers their rights and uh, solidarity to, to you and your union for the work that you're doing. I'm going to go on straight to our next speaker now who is uh, working very hard, I think, this week in particular with the budget um, and with negotiations with the Cabinet Office in particular on, on workers' pay. Um, so please welcome Mark Zawotka, PCS General Secretary. Well, thanks very much, Espana, and <clears throat> good evening to everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us. So um, very briefly, I just want to make these points. Um, in some ways, <clears throat> it's like deja vu, isn't it? It's like back to the future. Uh, ten years ago, we had a conservative or coalition government that was seeking uh, to use austerity to make workers pay the price for the folly of those at the top. And we had a Labour leadership that was not bold enough in advancing radical alternative solutions <clears throat> to what the Tories and the coalition were doing. And we had a trade union movement that had been on the back foot that actually looked and saw what students were doing in revolting against tuition fees and then getting its act into gear when it led industrial action of 2 million people fighting against pensions injustice. So for me, what we need to do is think back, learn the lessons of the past, both politically and industrially, and commit ourselves to not just arguing for what we want to see in a worker's budget, <clears throat> but actually probably more importantly, to what we're going to do to fight for justice in our communities and in our workplaces, given that the reality is that the general election is some years off and the key challenge for us at the moment is to resist and fight back as to what's happening. But from my point of view, in terms of what I think we should argue for and advocate over the period that the budget gives us the opportunities, I very much agree with Sarah. We must argue for huge hikes in the rate of sick pay. There shouldn't be waiting days. People should be entitled to proper rates of sick pay. We need a social security system that is not just about the 20 quid uplift on universal credit, but is about a system that does what it was designed to do after the war, which is to really provide support for people when they need it. And we are far away from that. We need a budget that gives us pensions justice, not as the Tories are currently planning <clears throat> to make public sector workers pay the price for the government's own illegality on public sector pensions. We need an end to the pay freeze. We need to recognize that public sector workers have performed heroic acts during the pandemic and to give them now a cut in their living standards is unacceptable. It's economically wrong, but it is unjust. And we need to argue for a huge 
amount of resources to be put back into our councils who have been starved of funds, cuts every single year, providing the services that people need in our communities. We need a huge hike in resources to the public sector. We need to see an insourcing revolution to end the injustices of privatization, to give people dignity at work so that public services are not run for shareholders and private profit, but are actually run in the interest of the people that they serve. And to do that, we should be absolutely clear that now is not the time to vacillate and be weak on the question of tax. Yes, we should argue for a rising corporation tax. Yes, we should argue for a wealth tax. Yes, we should argue that those with the broadest shoulders should pay the biggest price. And Labour's current reluctance to engage in that argument, to put front bench spokesmen on on the TV where we are all squirming in our seats as they go out of their way to avoid answering questions, in my view is one of the reasons why, despite a record of shame of 120,000 deaths, of a pandemic that saw a care homes crisis, a PPE crisis, a forcing people back to work crisis. It is absolutely outrageous that Boris Johnson appears to be quite comfortably ahead of Keir Starmer in individual poll ratings, and the Tories are ahead of Labour in most poll ratings. How could the Tories be ahead with that catastrophic record? In part, I think it's because people do not see the radical alternatives coming from the Labour leadership that are so desperate and need to be articulated at the time of a budget. So that's what I would like to see in a budget. The Tories aren't going to give us that. So the question is, we must go on the front foot policy wise to argue for a totally different type of society, one with fair rates of taxation that supports our public sector and actually puts money in people's pockets to regenerate the economy that we have. But what I also wanted to say, Espana, is that that's what we know we want to see, and that's what we know we won't get. So the question is, do we sit around and wait till the general election comes and hope that Labour pick up in the polls, or do we commit to resist what the Tories have got in store? And to that end, I think this Conservative government is different to ones of the past, not ideologically different, not different in wanting us to pay the price of the pandemic, but they might be a little bit slicker and faster on their feet in the way that they portray things. And indeed, we will hear them arguing that there isn't going to be austerity. That's not what we want. But actually, it's actions and deeds that matter, not Boris Johnson's words. And we know that austerity is already underway and we have to resist to fight it. So my concluding thoughts are this, that if the Labour leadership should look back 10 years and actually learn the lessons and realise it's a bold, radical alternative that is what is going to attract people to their mast, then so must the trade unions learn the lessons of 10 years ago. Because I have no qualms in saying that when history is written, the trade union movement collectively failed the challenge that austerity threw our way. We were unable, by and large, to work together, to campaign together, to use our unity as our greatest strength. And when we did demonstrate that over pensions in 2010-11, we saw the enormity of our potential strength, but our timidity scuppered that fight barely after it got off the ground. So we have to commit in communities, in unions, in workplaces, to say that we will argue for the policies that we need, but most importantly, we will lead the resistance to the attacks that we face. So if we know that Richie Sunak's pay freeze affects council workers, teachers, civil servants, lecturers, and everyone else, we must say that we must stand and fight together, not let them pick us off one by one. If we know that statutory sick pay is something that actually means that workers have to go into work when it is not safe because they cannot afford, for example, to often be off, we should unite in all our unions to say we will have a common fight to ensure that we get justice over social security, sick pay, and fight for things to be insourced. And that to me is the key lesson. The 10 years ago, too many of us found reasons why it was impossible to fight together rather than actually arguing why fighting together was essential and overcoming the obstacles. So we must learn from 10 years ago and ensure we are better prepared. That means radical policies, yes, but it means now building the call for action in all of our communities. And my last point therefore would be, we don't have to look far for inspiration. Those British gas workers fighting against fire and rehire, the people we have seen on strike in the private sector, the people in facilities management contracts, the people who are making stands a length and breadth of the country. And I will end with in my own union, where currently we are balloting 
over three and a half thousand people in the DVLA in Swansea, low paid workers, that has the biggest COVID outbreak of any workplace in the UK, 550 cases, one death, and yet the government is forcing two and a half thousand people into work every day, even though it's not safe. So we're balloting for an all out strike at the DVLA in Swansea, because if management won't keep our workers safe, the union will do everything we can to keep them safe. And therein is my very final message, which is yes, we wanna reopen the economy, Yes, we want to start getting things back on its feet, but we should have nobody forced back to work until it is safe. The vaccination has rolled out, infections have fallen, and we're on top of the new variants. And I think if we unite to fight for those things now, if we unite and fight against the pay freeze, and we unite to get the Labour leadership advocating bold policies, they can go up in the polls and we can resist the attacks that Richie Sunak is preparing for us and that he will announce on Wednesday. Thanks a lot, Espana. Thank you so much, Mark. And I really like what you said there about, you know, having a real appraisal of our movement and the enormity of our potential, you know, looking at the 2010, 2011 uh, pensions um, campaign as well. So I think that's so important what you just said there. There are now 1,000 people watching. Please do keep sharing on Facebook and Twitter to get even more people online. We've seen through the pandemic how many uh, people have come together organizing through unions, becoming uh, union members for the first time. Uh, so please keep liking and sharing and get our message out. Our next speaker is Miriam Kane from Black Liberation Alliance, uh, who's been campaigning for international black unity against imperialism and racism. And it gives me pl great pleasure to invite her, especially on a day where we had another statement from the Equalities Minister denying the impact um, denying the reality of uh, the experiences of black and ethnic minority people in this country in the healthcare system, uh, the discrimination, the racism that is faced. Um, and so it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Miriam Kane to, to speak to us today. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Sorry if you hear a bit of background noise, I'm in Senegal. Um, as African a bit loud. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so the Black Liberation Alliance believe in the unity of purpose between people of African, Arab, Asian and Caribbean descent. The attack facing our community range from the impact of COVID to racism to cut to walls. It's clear the impact on our community is disproportionate, unjust and brutal. Just as COVID has hit in the world, Black people had doubled the reason to cry out, I can't breathe. George Floyd died because a white police officer held his knee against his neck for eight minutes. That is longer than I will be speaking to you today. Black communities are oppressed not just because of the disproportionate impact of COVID, but also because of the historic and ongoing virus of racism. That has, light, that has lightened the world and been perpetrated by the West. We stand with families of George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmed Mahmoud in Wales and the countless black community communities. People have died due to racist policy. Black lives matter. And let us be clear, black lives will be key key struggle in the future of of, of, the, of, of our humanity. As a black Muslim disabled person, I'm disgusted at the approach of Britain to black communities. This is the fifth biggest economy. This is the fifth, this is the fifth biggest economy in the world and yet has failed to respond to the COVID crisis with humanity. People with learning disabilities have been given to not resuscitate orders. BAME doctors, nurses, and bus drivers have died disproportionately as a result of the pandemic. In, in my work, I have seen Black families being evicted from, uh, from their home and being more at risk of contacting COVID. But yet again, being asked, stay at home, stay put. How can you stay at home when you don't have one? From the outset, here have been report, um, reports of black staff being targeted to work in COVID wards and having less access to PPE. Black, Asian and ethnic minorities disproportionately dying while the government denying that institutional racism has been a key cause. 
That's why I back stand up to racism in calling for an inquiry into the disproportionate impact of COVID on Bain, work, uh, Bain communities. We need a zero COVID policy. This has crushed the virus in China, New Zealand and Vietnam amongst others. Prioritizing public health has led to these countries being, um, being able to gradually and safely open up the economy because they prioritize the most important part of the engine of the econ economy, the people. The stock construct, the US and the UK government put profit over people and have created some of the most dangerous countries to live in for death, um, uh, to live in for, for death from COVID, Lead leading to some of the highest death rates in the world. With Britain together with Brazil and South Africa, creating new mutation by falling to lock down properly and crush the virus. We need a zero COVID strategy if we are to stop preventable death and return to normality. Scientists and are already predicting that the most favorable outcome when lifting lockdown restriction in Britain could be 13,000 deaths. We cannot and must not accept this. This will be disproportionately amongst Bain communities. Every step that we fight against the disastrous policies of Boris Johnson's government is a step towards saving thousands of lives. We only need to look at the case of Beli Mujinga, a black public transport worker who contracted COVID after being spat at, which cost her life. This is the consequence of being black in the middle of, a, of the pandemic. But the racism during COVID does not stop there. Trump attempted to label coronavirus the China, the China virus. The reality that Trump's racist take on the pandemic has led to a rise in racist attacks against against people of Chinese origin and against people from South Asia. We must stand with all this community. You do not beat a pandemic with disunity. You beat it by united our communities. This is all the challenging, turbulent and difficult times. The Black Lives Matter movements have given thousands of us hope. I was proud to see that when Trump pulled out the milit military, the movement responded with something much more powerful, a global anti-racist resistance led by young people ready to put a racist like Trump in the dustbin of history. I was inspired by the Bristol demonstrators who looked down, took down the status of Edward Colston who profited directly from slavery. I have no doubt that this act is stands in the proud history of decent against, against injustice, which includes the suffrage, the Cable Street demonstrator, the Stonewall rioters, the anti-apartheid campaigner, all vilified by the establishment. And here in Britain, the Tories was Trump and critical allies. We can see in the inhuman policies to refugees, migrants, and Muslim. Only this week, Shamima Begum was just stripped on her um, of a uh, citizenship, a 15 year old girl groomed online by extremists. We all have our view about what justice she should face in Britain, but I think we can all agree it is a travesty to leave a child in a refugee camp stripped of her citizenship. You will not hear of a young white male far right shooter in the US ever being treated like this despite a murderous crime. And it is shameful that the current Home Secretary, Pretty Patel, called BLM dreadful. The Tories always uses a, uses a, use racism as a weapon of mass extraction. The most dreadful thing, thing in, the last, in the last week is the way they have treated this pandemic that has led 1,020 people, um, 1,020 deaths. One they have no clear way out of the current crisis, which is the costing lives and livelihood. In, in, including half a million employed young people and no clear way out of the impending climate crisis will cool cost us the earth. It is clear that we need a government that will unite and invest in people, public health, a green job, just as the NHS rebuild the economy and prioritize public health after the post-war slump. 
I will end by saying, let's take inspiration from the Black Lives Matter movement. If I can, if, if we can topple Trump, we can topple reaction. Building bridges, not war, to a better world. We must link up the labor movement, the anti-racist and equality movement, the school climate striker and A-level student fighting for a better, greener education. Let's build the Rambo coalition that can deliver a brighter future for humanity. And please do follow um, the Black Liberation Alliance on social media. We do share some content. There is an amazing event that we are planning to put together fairly soon. And I hope to see you guys all online on the 20th at the um, Stand Up to Racism UN online demo. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Miriam. And and, you know, thank you so much, Miriam. And there was so much insight there in terms of what's happening across our borders in, in different countries. Our recovery must definitely be international and display and manifest international solidarity. Our next speaker is a comrade who put Northwest Durham on the map, representing our movement and does so with equal vigor on the NEC. Uh, gives me great, great pleasure to invite to speak Laura Pidcock. Oh, thank you so, so much, Apsana. Uh, it's hard to follow Miriam to what a brilliant, brilliant contribution. I am sorry I can't stay for the whole meeting. I have got a pretty good excuse for organising in County Durham against the opening of a detention slash removal centre for women that's going to be built in Medemsley, Yarlswood, Mark II, if you like. So we've got a, a campaign meeting um, going on at exactly the same time as this. So greetings from that meeting to this, and I'm sure vice versa. Um, I, I think that I would also like to extend solidarity to um, Deepak on their universal credit campaign um, to keep the uplift and to extend it to legacy benefits. Um, I think that I wanted to give one, one important concept from this meeting, and that is the cost of the system as it currently is. You can probably hear my little boy as well, um, nipping, nipping to the loo before bed tonight. Um, and I wanted to think about the current cost to the planet, to our health, to our life expectancy, to the levels of fear and trepidation about the future that we feel of the current system. And I'm sure on Wednesday at the budget, there will be great efforts to make out that the budget is a remarkable one, that this is a recovery budget and that it's, you know, uh, you know, ambitious given the scale and intensity of the crisis. A crisis, of course, which has been intensified for most of us exactly because of the kind of political ideology this government subscribed to, one which privatises, places economic freedoms above health interests, which carves those binary balancing acts between the health of people and the economy, which we know is a bogus set of choices because we know that not acting soon enough meant people contracted the virus. The ignoring of the findings of exercise sickness. Can you remember talking about that at the very beginning of this crisis? All of the recommendations from that, that they ignored about how to handle a, a, a health crisis like this, the dismantling and privatization of the NHS into a US health model style, which takes resources out of communities, the staff shortages, the decimation of the welfare state, a decade of austerity, and the chilling chilling political aversion to a full and hard lockdown to take us towards full viral suppression. All of it is rooted in uh, decisions which do not prioritise our lives and our health above all. They have other interests that they prioritise and I'm sure there'll be much deconstructing of the economics and um, declare in our movement that this budget is a pathetic response to the crisis and um, the budget will, um, in, in, you know, because it will not include any change that, to the fundamental conditions that we need to transform our society and lift people out of poverty for good, which are essentially matters of control and power, not the kind of control and power that's often spoken about, but real control and power. The economic crisis that we face uh, is a failure to suppress the, the virus. There isn't any doubt about that. That's not the fault of working people who've been forced into their workplaces either through their essential work or because their employer makes them. Our demands must be consistent and firm. It is not 
and it will not be workers who should pay for the crisis, whatever your economic interpretation. And I want to be part of a movement which is standing in solidarity with those people who are making industrial demands, those uh, demands about making fellow workers safer, which are about protecting people from the dismantling of their terms and conditions. I want us as a movement to be adding millions upon millions of people to the trade union membership numbers. I think that is one of our biggest priorities because we are in a crisis of which we are still to realise its full effects. The capitalist system is in a state of crisis. And we have to sit back and think about what, what is the core of our movement? What is it now that we want after everything that working class communities have endured this last year in the UK and across the world? Can you imagine even in this crisis, no international ceasefire? That's what the system, uh, no, the system does. We want our class, in my mind, to escape poverty, insecurity, powerlessness and fear and for it to be placed replaced with abundance, security, power, joy and peace in the truest sense, in a way that's good for us all, in a way that repairs and does not destroy either planet or soul. This comes from not only arguing for a better legislative environment, from rally against, rallying against the government with and for our class, but for arguing for an entirely different system. Everything that we've endured in the last year proves that it is not only Sunak that has to go, but the capitalist economic system too. Thank you very much, Absana. Thank you so much, Laura. And I think it just provides so much ground for our next speaker to speak about trade union membership as well. You, you identified there one of the areas that we could really, really concentrate on in our movement. Our next speaker is uh, from Unite and the People's Assembly. So um, I invite to speak Steve Turner. Right, thanks very much, Absana. Really uh, enjoying the contributions so far. What an inspiring evening of uh, debate and positive debate as well about a positive future, not just looking back, trying to learn the lessons of the past, as important as they as are. It's also about looking forward and building that new economy, that new politics, that new society that people deserve. And I think um, from the outset, it's very clear right now that the country's at a crossroads not just because of COVID and the pandemic and the last 10 months, but we've seen 10 years of austerity and Labour against austerity, a rise, the People's Assembly, the movement actually, including trade unions, community groups, all of those that stood proud on platforms to fight and provide an alternative to austerity can be incredibly proud of the achievements that we've made during that period in keeping a very real alternative to austerity on the political and economic agenda. And that's really where we are now. Although we've got a Conservative government, of course, we've got a desperate need to put in place a pan to recover and rebuild, not just from COVID and the fallout from Brexit and post-Brexit trade, but meeting the challenges of the climate emergency as well, greening our economy, transitioning our industry, making the products locally through uh, resilient supply chains here in the UK that we need as a nation as well as uh, the globe in order to make sure that we protect our planet and the living standards of generations that haven't even been thought of yet, let alone uh, born onto this planet. So Wednesday's budget is going to determine the government's chosen route to doing this. Is it going to be a continuation of austerity politics, that privatisation, shrinking the state agenda, making ordinary working class people and our communities pay the price, a continuing pay freeze, of course, for our COVID heroes in our public services, our local government and others, of course, or whether or not it's going to be an intervening, investing, supporting uh, budget where we're going to grow the economy where we're going to create a million new green jobs. We're going to go protect our industrial heartlands and our communities, where we're going to use the state as a tool to intervene with a windfall tax on those uh, profitable corporations, many of whom have made billions during the course of this COVID uh, pandemic. Whether or not it's going to be about raising corporation tax so that profit on business pays the price moving forward, or whether it's not uh, closing the loopholes on tax evasion 
and avoidance, whether it's rebalancing the economy from an over-reliance on service industries and capital finance in particular, to one that puts manufacturing and creating the tools, the products that we need to transition our economy here in the UK. Whether or not the budget invests in people or jobs, put in paying the pockets of those people that will invest and spend in our communities when we reopen and we will reopen the vaccines going to assist us to put our shops and our high streets back on the agenda and we need people to spend money back in our in our uh, shops in our pubs in our restaurants going to our theaters supporting all of those jobs and those sectors of the economy that have been devastated during the course of the pandemic we need to end the pay freeze, of course, for all key, key workers, all of our COVID heroes. When that list of key workers was first introduced, you didn't see billionaires, hedge fund managers, uh, CEOs of big corporations. You saw some of the most vulnerable, some of the most exploited people in, in industry right there at the forefront, putting their lives on the line to save other people's lives and to care for the most vulnerable. So if we're gonna end in work poverty, if we're gonna make sure that work pays, but retirement and no work, unemployment and poverty in, in retirement ends, ending fuel poverty and food poverty, ending the obscenity of evictions from rented uh, accommodation. If we're going to do that, then we've got to stop the corporate welfare state that subsidizes low pay, that allows employers to simply hive off their profits to the nearest hedge fund, to the nearest tax haven. We need to make sure that we close all of those loopholes and increase government debt now to do it. So we can afford to extend the £20 universal credit uh, payment. We can afford to make sure that all legacy claimants get that as well. And I want to add my congratulations to uh, earlier comments about the DPAC Day of Action today and the eight years, actually, that our members in our communities have been fighting universal credit, a failed system from day one, but making sure that a proper solidarity fund is in place. The point that Mark made earlier about at the end of the Second World War, it was about providing dignity and justice for working people and our communities. And if you couldn't work for whatever reason, some of the most vulnerable people in society were protected from destitution with a solidarity fund. And that's what we need to get back to. And debt has never been cheaper for the state. We can repay this debt over 50, 60 and 70 years. We've just finished paying off the debt from the Second World War. It's zero interest rates now. We can afford to have a long term plan to invest in pay protection, to extend furlough for those that need it for as long as they need it, to deal with its sick pay inadequacies and make sure that people can afford to self isolate. Because if it's a choice between self isolating and doing the right thing or putting food on the table, I know what ordinary working people are going to do. And that means that we've got to make sure that furlough is the absolute minimum payment that people that are off on sick. Uh, achieve. We want to make sure that there's long term support for the sectors that won't return, whether it's hospitality, uh, retail sector, entertainment, core manufacturing sectors. And we need to create the million decent, well paid, secure jobs that we need for a future. Unionized jobs, God forbid it, with collective bargaining and strong trade union organization within them, dealing with green tech and new innovations, rebalancing our economy. This week, we launched our Magnificent Seven shovel riddle projects that the Chancellor could pick up on Wednesday and say, we're going to do that. Build the council homes that we need and retrofit the rest of our stock. Put broadband into everybody's home, high speed fiber optic broadband, cable manufactured here. Invest now in green energy, hydro and wind, nuclear and solar. Develop synthetic fuels, gather hydrogen, capture and store our carbon emissions. Make the planet livable and breathable for generations to come. You can have a plan for full employment, but you've got to have a vision to deliver it. We can manufacture here in the UK what we need. And for every one manufacturing job, we'll create four elsewhere. We can end homelessness. We can end growing inequalities. We can have collective bargaining and strong trade unions, but they're not going to just give it to us. They've never given us anything. We need a 1945 vision and an organisation that's prepared to fight for it, to drive that rebuild strategy. No business as usual. 
no zero hours contracts, no precarious work, no getting hired and fired by an algorithm on a platform somewhere, no, no minimum wage, low paid jobs that you can't afford to live on. Let's make sure that we've got shared work. We share our commonwealth that we create, create that new politics, that new economy. All of that is possible. But it's Mark's point about what are we going to do to win it? And that's our challenge. And we can't outsource it to anybody. We can't outsource it to Westminster, whether it's a Labour government or a Tory one. We've got to take control of that as trade unionists, as organised labour and build those social movements that get us into every community up and down the country having this sort of debate. Building, inspiring and motivating people to stand up and join a collective organised fight back for that better world we not only deserve, but we can win. And I'll leave it there, Asperna. Thank you so much, Steve. And for everybody that's tuned in, please do follow at Unite Politics on Twitter so you can see Unite's 10-point budget plan. And a big shout out to Gold Northwest and London uh, wrapped uh, bus drivers who have been striking against unfair pay and conditions um, this week and last week. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Matt Wilgress, who's going to be telling us a little bit more about how we can build our movement with the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Apsana. Thank you, Steve, and all our speakers. Um, it's great to have such a good turnout again tonight. Um, and thank you to all the volunteers as well who do so much to get these events streaming and sharing links and so on. Um, just some very quick plugs for me, really. First, please do hit that share button if you're watching the stream on Facebook. And if you're on Twitter, please do retweet the tweet of the live stream, which will come up in the chat in a minute. It does bring new people in and get new people watching our events. The other thing, as we always have to say these things, but it is important, is if you can, please donate £10 or what you can afford at the link provided. Um, all the things we've been using throughout lockdown, Restream, Zoom webinar, MailChimp, web hosting, they all cost extra money. Um, and we've grown so much in the last year that they cost a lot more money than they did at the start, which is a good thing. But we do need your support, so please do donate if you can. Um, it's already been mentioned, I think, earlier by Apsana, but please do support our workers can't wait 10 demands which you can sign the petition and please also keep campaigning on two other things we have petitions on and one is the universal credit which now it's being briefed that they might keep the uplift for any three months obviously they shouldn't be a cut full stop and we can't let the pressure off on that and the other is the sick pay petition that people have mentioned that which we've launched there as well and um, other things is please do follow and read our media partner labor outlet um, columnists on this call tonight, including Atsana, John McDonnell and Richard Bergen, um, two campaign group MPs a week and regular news and views from the movement on the other days as well. So please don't miss out on that and you can follow that at Labour Outlook on Facebook and Twitter. Um, that's all for me. Thanks to all the speakers and also please donate if you can. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. I'm going to quickly go over now to our next speaker from Health Campaigns Together, Dr John Lister. You're muted, John. The ultimate quote of 2020. Dear, dear. I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, uh, our NHS needs not just a cash injection, but a major cash transfusion, not just to survive COVID and repair the damage it's done by lengthening waiting lists, but to reverse the brutal decade of disinvestment since 2010. Staff at the front line delivering patient care were already running on empty before COVID struck. Since then, the pandemic has stretched, stressed and tested them as never before. A full year of fighting the virus that was given extra chances to spread by repeated government delays, ineptitude, tragically ill-judged policies like Rishi Sunak's eat out to spread the virus and the pathetic privatised test and trace system. What do I mean by running on empty? a series of what in the rail industry they call SPADs, signals passed at danger. The NHS was not only ill-equipped to deal with a pandemic, it was in no fit state to cope with the British winter without crisis measures. Throughout 2019, especially in the run up to the December election, there were warnings from many organizations that the NHS needed more investment. But Boris Johnson won, committed only to implementing Theresa May's 2018 promise to increase NHS spending by 34 billion in cash terms by 2024. That's just 20.5 billion extra in real terms over five years, according to the Treasury, well below the level of increase needed to keep pace with cost pressures and nowhere near the amount to make up for the last 10 years. 
That grossly inadequate increase has now been enshrined in law. Immediately after the, the election, the BMA pointed to a £6.2 billion black hole in future NHS finances. NHS providers belatedly pointed out that if NHS and social care spending had risen each year in line with the average prior to David Cameron taking office, the Department of Health budget would already have been £35 billion higher per year. The cash shortages have brought capacity shortages and therefore put performance on almost every level as uh, has lagged ever further behind from the high water mark of 2010. Even before the pandemic, the 95% target to see and treat or discharge A&E patients within four hours had not been met in England for five years. 65,000 patients needing admission spent at least four hours on waiting, waiting on trolleys in September 2019. That's 46% higher than the same month the year before and 1,400% higher than in 2010. The 62-day target to start cancer treatment had only been met once in five years, with more than 20% waiting longer than that. The, these waiting lists had soared to 4.5 million, with 15% of them waiting over 18 weeks. 9,000 frontline and general and acute beds had closed since 2010, along with 5,200 mental health beds. That's 22% of the 2010 capacity. Staff shortages were rampant with promises of 6,000 6, extra GPs and 50,000 extra nurses proving to be worthless. GP numbers actually fell and it turned out the 50,000 extra nurses included retaining 18,000 nurses already working in the NHS and recruitment of thousands of trained nurses from overseas as Brexit drove thousands of EU staff out and Priti Patel smirkingly slammed the door on immigration. Inadequate provision of capital has not only made a nonsense of Johnson's promises of new hospitals, uh, but it's, it's left hospitals crumbling for lack of maintenance. The backlog maintenance bill for NHS rose by almost 40% in 2019 to 20 alone to nine billion pounds. In July 2019, fire chiefs threatened to close down parts of four hospitals that have become a hazard to patients and staff. NHS providers the next month warned the NHS annual capital budget is now less than the entire, ent entire backlog maintenance bill, which is growing by 10% a year. During 2020, it got worse. Thousands more NHS beds were closed and thousands left unoccupied for infection control, social distancing and to switch off staff, switch staff and equipment to COVID wards and ICU. So as we've said in our rescue plan for health campaigns together, to restart the NHS as a comprehensive service will require a substantial one-off increase in cash, plus increased annual spending. But, but as a once in, in the century event, the pandemic requires extraordinary event measures, including a complete rethink on the long-term plan and on local plans to reconfigure services and build new hospitals, and a halt to all sales of NHS building and land pending the costing of fresh plans to rejig and refurbish existing buildings with social distancing to restore capacity, reopen closed beds and avoid any need to spend billions hiring private hospitals. Investment in expanded mental health services and community support for those with long COVID is also desperately needed. A workforce transformation plan coupled with a substantial pay increase for all NHS and social care staff an investment in a programme to recruit and train thousands more health and social care professionals, and full reimbursement for trusts for all the additional revenue and capital costs of tackling the COVID epidemic. So we need an even more ambitious equivalent to the 10-year investment programme from 2000 to 2010, which reduced the waiting lists and waiting times and improved NHS performance on all fronts. We know austerity worsens the health of the poorest, and COVID has further widened inequalities. So the extra cash has to come from the rich, the free ride for wealthy scroungers, the tax dodgers and billionaires must stop. It's time to look after people, not profits. Let's pet fight to make them pay their share for the sake of our health. Thank you so much, John. I think that was so insightful, especially when, you know, we're, we're at a point now where the, where the Secretary of State for Health has just announced also 40 new buildings for hospitals. So it's so important that we, we push back at this uh, crucial time and, and when we've seen what's been happening with at least 49 GP practices as well being uh, sold off to uh, US corporations. Uh, for everyone that is tuned in and for everyone that has just tuned in, keep showing your support for this evening's meeting on social media and help us say no to Austerity 2.0. We're using the hashtag Budget 2021 to uh, keep picking up on your views and comments. Our next speaker is Pascal Robinson from We Own It, who I'm sure will say a bit about what I've been just talking about and more. Over to you, Pascal. 
Thanks, Apsana. Um, thank you so much for having me. So uh, just to introduce We Own It really quickly, we campaign for public ownership of public services. That's our schools, our hospitals, our care homes, because we need them to be run for people, working the best they can for communities, not for profit. So we've had several victories, including winning our campaign to stop the privatisation of the body NHS professionals. We brought the East Coast Railway Line. We helped bring the East Coast Railway line back into public ownership, uh, public control rather, and we succeeded in our campaign to get probation brought back into public ownership. But Lord knows we have a long way to getting well-funded, publicly uh, run democratic services. And I want to speak today about why any budget needs to have huge ambition for our public services, needs to bring them into public hands and invest in them immediately. So Public ownership will make sure that every penny spent goes to supporting jobs and a more stable economy for the future. So an example of that, um, a bit different from what other people have been speaking about tonight, is buses. Buses have had, bus companies have had over a billion pounds of public money. But the bailouts to bus companies have come with few requirements, which has made it much harder to plan in the pandemic. And we know that bus companies plan on cutting services when that support stops. Right now, go-aheads in Manchester are threatening fire and rehire, meaning that drivers will be paid with worse sick pay during a pandemic. And this is an absolute scandal, especially considering the sacrifices I personally know drivers in Manchester have taken to work on the front line this last year. We need to bring buses into public hands so that we can make sure every penny goes to those buses and to workers and not a few shareholders' pockets. We need control over this vital public service so that the money goes towards expanding our bus networks, creating jobs and ensuring that we deal with the climate crisis. Um, workers in the bus industry should in no way be threatened with the sack right now. And I want to say that we stand with bus drivers in Greater Manchester and ask everyone on this call to send an email to the CEO of Go Ahead to tell him to stop this attack right now. Hopefully there's a link in, in various chats. Um, and uh, I can put one if not. So we want every local authority to be able to bring buses into public control and ownership, which they legally can't even do right now. And they certainly don't have the support to do this from central government. When the government talks about leveling up, this is what it would actually look like. Us having functioning pu publicly owned bus networks. Moving forward, the Chancellor should use this opportunity to change who the economy benefits and make sure that public money is best used for all of us. And that means public services that allow all of us to live full, healthy lives. And there are certain people who this pandemic has affected hugely, the sick, the old and people of colour. And so not recovering well will affect them most. And we need to properly hold our government to account on that. Of course, our NHS should be invested in heavily as uh, John just highlighted to make up for many lost years and we need to make sure that we don't hand out any more contracts to long-term contracts to private companies like Centene or Spire hospitals and again we've got a petition on this please join in the campaign to stop Centene getting any control over GPs in London. The UK is actually seen as a low spender on healthcare. In 2016, the UK spent 8.5% of GDP on healthcare, less than Germany, Spain, and the list goes on. So we need to replace all of the beds that we've lost in the last year, halt any sales of NHS estates, and increase workers' pay. This might seem like a lot of change and a huge investment, but what we've seen is that this government can take big action when it needs to, and we need solutions that match the scale of the problems that we're facing. Successive governments have chosen to cut public funding to the bone. They've wired in underinvestment and insecurity, and this mix with privatisation has left our public services creaking. Predictions show that around a third of the population will be living below the minimum income standard by May this year. And of course, the climate crisis. We face a real opportunity to move our economy towards what it should be working for, lifting people out of poverty and improving everyone's quality of life. And I really look forward to fighting with everyone on this call to make sure that that happens. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pascal. I think that was so informative. And I think, again, just going back to the point around buses in, in, and the experiences of bus workers at this at this particular time. And for those that have tuned in, I mean, you know, how much do we know about the experiences of our bus drivers in the pandemic? They've disproportionately borne the, borne the brunt of the pandemic, taking our key workers 
to work. They are key workers themselves. And, you know, often we don't realize um, their experiences from not having enough loo breaks to having, um, you know, new facilities. These are just some of the things that they, they're experiencing and have experienced before the pandemic. And that call to bring buses into public ownership is so, so important. Thank you. Our next speaker could not make it in person uh, today to, to uh, join us online, um, but I do have a statement from them. And um, the speaker is Dave Wood, as the General Secretary of the Communications Workers Union, um, who many will know, um, members of which have been um, uh, calling for support, particularly BT Openreach workers, who again are another, um, hopefully not a casualty, but are um, at risk of having uh, their uh, pay and conditions changed uh, through, uh, through tactics uh, by their employer. So he says that COVID-19 has lifted the lid on our broken society and has exposed an, an economy that is built on exploitation. The virus has put our flawed economic model in the hot seat with economists from across the left and right now arguing for a different way of doing things. There is very little public support for simply restoring the old economic model or returning to business as usual. And that opens up the space to ask questions about what kind of economy and what kind of society we want to see. The response to the budget offers Labour the perfect opportunity to present that different vision. But we cannot fight the battle on old ground. It is clear from the latest Tory rhetoric that they know any return to austerity will be rejected by the British public. But we will have to scrutinise this latest about turn from the Tories closely. Whilst the right has tried to steal a march by adopting a new rhetoric aimed at working people, we all know too well that whilst they might talk about working class communities, they will never deliver. At the heart of the campaign for a people's budget must be a distinct trade union agenda that is centered on the campaign for a new deal for workers. The CWU campaign to empower working people in the, in the more modern economy. It is in addressing the concerns of working people that we can expose the Tory rhetoric for what it is building collectivism from the ground up as we go and unite our communities behind a new economic model that delivers for all. And on that note, it's a great pleasure to invite uh, the former Shadow Chancellor, um, who I think knows a thing or two about the functions of the Treasury and, and the upcoming budget. Um, so over to you, John McDonnell. Thanks, Afsana. Thank you. And <clears throat> Afsana, I just want to say thanks to you as well, because of the work that you're doing at the moment, which I don't think people are fully aware of in terms of exposing what's happening with regard to the privatisation of GP services across our country, and particularly in London. Thanks for the work you're doing on that. And I know, I know it's arduous, but yeah, you're having an effect. Um, before Richard finishes the meeting with one of his brilliant speeches, I want to just maybe take quietly a, a moment to run through the significance of the situation that we're in. I want to follow on from Mark, what Mark said really, because I actually think we're on the edge of a important struggle that we need to really recognize and, and gear up for. Um, Mark will correct me if I've got the wrong person, but I think it was Nye Bevan who said that the Tories never talk about class war because they're too busy in engaging in it. And I think that's what's happened for the last nine to 10 months intensively. In the, when you're facing a national emergency like, well, like the Second World War or like the pandemic, people don't want to see sort of political knockabout or anything like that. They expect people to come together to save lives. And that's what, actually that's what our class have done. In fact, and they've made sacrifices. What is it now? 900 health workers have died from COVID as a result. I think because of the sacrifices that they've made in their determined struggle to keep us safe. And it's the same with social care workers, it's the same with workers in transport. They've just really tried to make hold this country and its economy and its society together. But you know, the Tories haven't respected that. They have engaged in I don't know how else to describe it, but class war for the last nine or 10 months. And every speaker has outlined the different ways in which they, they've done it. Um, Sarah talked about the issue around sick pay. At the beginning of this crisis, 
because of the lack of support for workers, workers were being forced to go into work in unsafe conditions and people lost their lives as a result. Because of the, exactly as Sarah said, the low levels of sick pay and the low levels of financial support meant workers had to choose between hardship or their health. And some of them chose, unfortunately, to sacrifice their health because they had no other alternative, realistically. And I'm glad she pointed that out. What Mark and Steve and others, have, and Pascal just then, in regard to the buses, the Tories have been waging class war on an industrial scale on the industrial front for nine and 10 months. Look at what's happening. Mark quoted PCS and the disputes they're having. DVL, DVLA workers were forced into unsafe conditions. And as a result of that, have many of them contracted COVID. But I also give you the example of the PCS workers at Heathrow Airport. We've had two deaths there. And now we've got a dispute because the management are imposing, well, working conditions which are unacceptable, but also are a health risk as well. And we've now got the bus disputes taking place. And the bus disputes are following the model of Heathrow Airport Limited and what BA tried to do, but for the strength of the union forcing them back, was the introduction of fire and rehire, whereby whole workforces are sacked and then only re-employed if they accept wages cut on a massive level, but also the undermining of work, working conditions. And I have to say alongside of that, we have seen in systematic efforts by employers to actually target and victimize trade union reps and try to undermine the basic of trade, the exercise of trade union rights across a whole range of sectors. And the Tories have not just stood to one side, they've subsidized the undermining of these conditions. These are companies have received massive financial support, unconditional financial support. So in some companies, they've been using the resources paid for by the taxpayer to enable them to sack their own workers. And it just goes on. Um, Laura Pickrop, before she went, drew attention to what's happening with regard to poverty in our country. Um, only last weekend, some of you may have seen the most recent survey, where we don't talk about poverty anymore, we talk about destitution. Destitution has doubled in this country over this last period. It started after 10 years of austerity, and we had the UN rapporteur on poverty exposing what was happening, but now we've seen a rapid, rapid increase in severe poverty, destitution, and again, homelessness rising again. And the evictions are now starting again. John Lister has pointed out exactly what's been happening in terms of the underfunding of the NHS, but the privatization it goes on apace. And what I think offends most of us is the blatant corruption that's going on in terms of the award of COVID contracts you know, to friends of Tory ministers, their neighbours, someone they met in the pub, or someone who they have some form of financial connection with as a result of the donations that are going in to Tory coffers as a result. And again, what's happening in social care is we've seen as a result of years of neglect, we've seen people's lives put at risk. But I agree with Steve, the, the, the fear that we've got now is as we come out of one crisis, we're now gonna face the existential threat of climate change. And unless we have an economy that's transformed to actually enable us to, well, yes, to enter that just transition that we've been arguing for for so long, we actually then got to even put our very existence at risk. So throughout that, I think throughout this last nine months, the Tories have been waging class war throughout. And there's been no, there's been no sort of attempt to hold back in terms of the virulent attack on working people, on their working conditions, on their employment conditions, in terms of their trade union rights, or in their wages or basic benefit support, whether it's sick bay universal credit or whatever. 
And again, and others have echoed the fact that, yes, we want the £20 maintained on universal credit uh, and we want that extended to legacy benefits. But to be honest, living on universal credit at whatever level, even with the additional £20, is driving people into hardship and poverty. And as we've seen, destitution as well. We want the whole thing scrapped and we want a proper social security system where Social security really does mean security for families overall. But in this week of all weeks, this is the week in the budget when our argument should be about how we establish a, an economy that does work for everybody, that does plan for the future, that is invested in, as Steve has said, in terms of the, the jobs that we need to tackle climate change. But we can only do that if we can fund it in a way which is fair and rational. Of course, you borrow in a crisis like this. In fact, you know, the whole exercise of monetary policy has to be on the basis of ensuring that people are supported throughout the crisis. And yes, you do start investing for the long term. And this is not rocket science. It's actually what even Tory governments have done in the past. But also, you know, this is the opportunity for a fair taxation system. This is the opportunity to put in place the basic funding of our public services and our economy on the basis of fairness. And the proposal, again, very straightforward. What we wanted is a fair taxation system and that we always planned that corporation tax would go up on a staggered basis as we grew the economy because corporation tax is levied on the profits that companies make. And we saw a dramatic cutback by the Tories to a level which was the lowest corporation taxes, not just in Europe, but in the US as, as well. But we also put alongside that, actually, we wanted the other sectors of the economy, other beyond the normal manufacturing and service sectors, we expected finance to play its role. That's why a financial transaction tax was key to the proposals we were putting forward for taxation. The City of London has, has boomed during the pandemic speculators have made fortunes. So therefore, a financial transaction tax would simply make sure that they made some contribution for the future. But we also said, yes, we would level up capital gains tax with income because it was, if you earn your income going to work, and you earn your income from your sale of assets, well, you should be taxed in exactly the same way. But there is one other area that we've been campaigning for in these recent months, and Steve raised it, and it is a simple, it is absolutely simple. It is that actually to, we've got a problem in that working people are falling in large numbers into debt. And there's, the last figure was over 7 million are now falling behind into debt, not be able to pay their household bills. We now have three quarters of a million families and individuals who've fallen behind with their housing payments, their rent and their mortgage payments. We're in a situation where actually insecurity is breathing instability and also putting people under such stress that we're having a mental health pandemic. There's an sim extremely simple solution, which is a windfall tax on those that have benefited through the crisis over the last nine to 10 months. And they're straightforward. It's all those who issue mortgages within the finance sector, the banks and others who've made massive profits with this property speculation boom that's gone on over the recent months. It's also a windfall tax on corporate landlords who again have had no cut in their rents and are still making significant profits. In fact, we've had another 40,000 buy to let landlords registered in this recent period and actually, getting tax breaks by registering in that form. But it's also those streaming services, those delivery services, the supermarkets and others who actually, actually have made such, I think, grotesque levels of profits in this recent period. And I have to say also those, those who have been issued with COVID contracts by their Tory friends, have made significant profits. You put that group together, a relatively, you know, a relatively moderate windfall tax would enable us to wipe out the debt of all of those who have fallen behind 
on their rents and mortgages. And actually for many would be able to go a much further as well in terms of funding some of the aspects of reform of our social security system to lift people out of poverty. So my view this week is what we've got to do is yet put our arguments up. I think a simple demand of over a windfall tax actually is the one that could catch the wind. But if we don't see that happening within the budget this week, I doubt if we don't see that happening, it, it should become a central campaigning theme throughout this coming period. But I think, because I think people see out there the grotesque unfairness in our society as well. The way in which people have sacrificed so much in our NHS and social care services to keep us safe and across sectors of the economy to keep the economy going. But in a way in which profits have been accrued by those who speculated and those you know, the rentier capitalists, if you like, who through housing and by, uh, by being corporate landlords, by being owners of streaming services, by owners of supermarkets, have profiteered. And in that way, actually, we can get a fair taxation system permanently, but at the same time, we can fund so much to lift people out of poverty. So finally, I just want to say this, the choice of been wage, wage and class war for this last 10 months. I think what we've got to do is fight them back and fight them back firmly as well. So that means exactly as others have said, every mobilization that there is, we swing behind. So for every strike, automatic support. We might not be able to go on physical pit, picket lines, but we can in terms of online, and we can use every mechanism we can to communicate that support. For others who are resisting evictions and resisting rent rises, we support them wholeheartedly and do all we can that we, actually to ensure people keep a decent roof over their heads. And it's the same with all those campaigning against privatization of our, our public services. I think we're entering into a period of struggle. The Tories will continue on with their ambitions. They'll use the rhetoric stolen from us on some policy areas, but we know the way in which they'll use those to ensure that their friends maximize their profits and at the same time undermine the ability of working people to have a decent quality of life. So this period of struggle coming up, there's a, rest, there's a lot resting on our shoulders and we need to recognize the role that we'll have to play in solidarity with all these movements. And with regard to the mechanisms that we use, of course, for us as Labour Party members, what we've got to do is demand democracy in the Labour Party so that we can actually discuss issues again, making sure that our policies are voted on at this year's Labour Party conference and maximise that vote in support of them. Create our own manifesto from the rank and file if necessary, but also through the other vehicles of the Labour and Trade Union movement and every campaign, many of them are outlined in the discussions today, whether it's we own it or keep the NHS public or whatever, we mobilize en masse. And I'm hoping when, as we come through this pandemic, we'll be back out on the streets again, mobilizing in support of the transformation of our society that we've, well, I think we developed the policies for in 2017, 2019. And what we need now is a government articulating those policies again, of, but also an unstoppable climate of opinion so that whoever goes into government from Labour actually is required to implement them and has the support to do that. Solidarity. Thanks so much, John. And I think um, it's such a credit to yourself and the work that you've done over the years, popularising so much of the policies uh, we so <laughs> desperately need to change um, you know, the entire economic system. Um, before we go to our next and final speaker, I just want to thank everyone for participating. Hundreds of more New people have been joining the event throughout the evening. We know we have so many important battles ahead and also we know just how much our campaigning for people, uh, for health for and, and the planet um, to be put first is. We must continue to build resistance to the Tories and popularize socialist alternatives. And we must keep working together to insist that there is no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and politics and to argue for the immediate uh, public health and economic support measures that people so desperately need. Please also donate at the link provided so we can continue hosting these really important events. And of course, please keep signing and sharing the workers can't wait petition on hashtag workers can't wait. So our next and final speaker is somebody who's been calling for increases in statutory sick pay, one of the lead advocates of the zero COVID strategy in the UK alongside Diane Abbott. Uh, so over to the secretary of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, Richard Bergen. 
Thanks so much, uh, Apsana, and thanks to the Labour Assembly Against Austerity for hosting this uh, fantastic meeting. And thanks to every single person who's joined us tonight uh, for this call. It'll be fantastic eventually when we can safely get together again in the normal way. Now, when the COVID crisis hit, as one of the world's wealthiest countries, we should have been very well placed to limit the damage. But instead, the government's response has been catastrophic. One of the world's largest death rates and the worst hit major economy. Now, the Prime Minister must take responsibility for this. But the rot goes much deeper than Boris Johnson alone. It's a result of 40 years of neoliberalism, a rotten, corrupt ideology, which has left us with a failed state. Because what else can you call it when over 100,000 people have died unnecessarily? And it left us with weak public services, a failing social care system, a woeful lack of workers' rights, and a hollowed out social security system, all when we needed them most. Millions of people have had their eyes opened to just how broken that system is. So this crisis must be a watershed, the moment to kill off the idea that unfettered free markets, privatizations, outsourcing, and cuts to public services are somehow the answer to all our ills. Labour's leadership has said that this must be a 1945 moment, a fork in the road, and I completely agree with that. Something new will replace the pre-crisis economy that was already broken when COVID struck. Now, it's our job as the opposition to lead the debate on what that new economy looks like, to ensure that it's an economy that serves the many, not the few. Now, I know it's formally called Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition, but in my view, there's been too much loyalty to a failing government and not enough opposition. In the deepest crisis in decades, Labour needs to be much bolder in offering an alternative. The crisis is now, and so the Labour Party needs to have answers now on the big issues facing our communities. Now, this isn't counterposed to preparing to win in 2024. It's an essential part of preparing to win in 2024 by showing people day after day that we have their backs and we have a better way forward for them. And we can't just sidestep big debates when they happen. The tax debacle of the past few days shows that if we continue to do so, then our party will be outflanked by the Tories with their phony rhetoric of levelling up. We can win the argument for a progressive tax system, but only if we make the case. Now, of course, as a party, we should be clear that the best way to pay down the debts incurred through emergency measures in this crisis is by creating jobs and creating growth, investment-led growth, not cuts and austerity. That's how we deal with the deficits. But on tax, we also need to lead the debate. That means a windfall tax on super profits made during this crisis, including on those companies who made huge gains due to their links to top Tories. It means increasing corporation tax, just as Biden is doing in the USA, whilst also making it fairer by charging lower rates for struggling smaller local businesses than for multinationals making super profits. It means higher taxes on dividends and capital gains so the rich aren't paying lower rates on their wealth than many workers pay on their wages. And it means the very high earners paying more, including with a new 50% income tax rate on those earning above £125,000. And if we argue that growth is the way to drive down the deficit, then we must have a strategy for jobs and growth. Even before the COVID crisis, we'd had a decade of low growth, low wages, low investment, low productivity. We can't rely on the same rigged economic model to deliver something better in the future. Our alternative must be a state-led plan that serves people and planet, not the 1%. The first part of that plan must be a package of emergency measures to protect people from the worst excesses of this crisis. 
a people's bailout because the banks were bailed out. So why shouldn't our communities? An emergency package would include a pay rise for all public sector workers, rent relief, furlough extended, but also guaranteeing that no one on furlough is paid less than the minimum wage, proper sick pay, boost to social security, and so much more. But beyond that, we need to be calling for state investments that transition the economy to meet the challenges of the future, not providing more life support for a broken economic model based on low pay, insecure jobs that for decades have failed people and planet. A model which twice in the past 15 years in the global banking crisis and the COVID crisis has needed the state to bail it out and where huge public funds are often allocated based on dodgy political connections. So we need to wage an argument, not just for more public investment in jobs and growth, but also paint a vision of how that investment will build a better society. One that can deal with the great challenges of the next decades. A vision of how we tackle climate change, mass unemployment and regional decline with a Green New Deal that creates millions of skilled new jobs and gets us on the path to net zero carbon by 2030. A vision of a society based on the solidarity and community spirit we saw at the start of this crisis through the rebuilding of our public services, renewing not only our social fabric, but also creating good jobs that serve our society. A vision of a society that creates older people with dignity, not as profit-making opportunities and a publicly run national care service. A vision of a society where people have the dream of a good home fulfilled through the building of millions of quality council houses. A vision where no child goes hungry and poverty is abolished with a social security system that treats people with respect and doesn't punish them. In conclusion, this crisis isn't the moment to suspend politics, it's a moment to deepen politics. Our party needs to start leading that fight and with your help I think we can make sure that it does. Thank you and on that burning note all I have left to say is join us at the next Arise supported event on Saturday the 13th of March at two o'clock on anti-war politics today with none other than 